Mi yeah, Mrs. Fairbrother got a first name, anyone? very strategic and tactical cunningness on behalf of the writers, the, the birth of Rosie has both sort of, and, and if you look straight away, Rosie is as connected as Jill. She's more connected. Helen. 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 <laughs> Who thinks Helen is a posh name? <laughs> oh, oh So yeah, you can see here, so this is weighted for centrality and only by birth or marriage. And actually, I think that's right. Yeah, people have links to their own uncles and aunts, because as we know, the, co the cousinage of Ambridge was like the whole thing. So by virtue of having links to Robin Fairbrother, Rex and Toby and Helen... No, I think it might not be Helen. <laughs> <laughs> Simone. 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 That sounds right. So Helen's Robin's mother. Ah, Helen is Robin's mother. Simone is Mrs. Fairbrother. Oh, I'm glad we got there. But the, the point is, whatever question mark is, the point is made that even Kenton, with his extremely differentiated mating strategy, is less central to the future of Brookfield than Rosie. And that is why, of course, Jill was so bonkers about the arrival of the Fairbrothers, because she saw it. Either she'd been in the long-range script reading or had a, sense of, <laughs> had a sense of the fateful drama playing out intergenerationally. And isn't the arch just wonderful? I mean, we are talking about people who do not exist. 70 years ago. Way. who's genuinely an anarchist. <laughs> Three in the front row, just checking if I'm doing any casteism. <laughs> you are aware that in the subcultural world of Ambridge fandom, the anarchists have a specific position in that they've been going a long time. They're the, the cleverest of all of us, and they truly believe that the option is real. <laughs> so, this has also changed. This is the other half of the big network, and this is the this is, um, this, is, uh, this is the other, the other bit now. Um, I, did, I did the network, I redid the network once we had lost the patriarch of the Grundies. Um, and once we had gained Tracy, whose children I couldn't remember the names of, but they're Brad and Chelsea, aren't they? Now, Chelsea and Brad, yeah. So, this is still the clan of Peggy. Again, it's still more numerous. And by virtue of this key hinge here and the marriage of Alice Aldridge to Christopher Carter, yeah. everybody else in the village is connected by birth or marriage. I mean, it's, that's, you know, incestuous, right? So, so this is the up-to-date clan of Peggy as of now. And what's interesting here is, if you look at the, 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 the... This demonstrates, despite people's lack of love for Kate, by virtue of having children in such a, you know, uh, differentiated fashion, <laughs> she has become a key node in that network and in that family. Interesting. Um, I don't have much more to say about the clan of Peggy, except that, can everybody remember what I think is going to transform the granny power of Ambridge? It was mentioned yesterday. Mungo. Mungo. Because who are Mungo's grannies? So, in 2016, this bit here stood out because, and this I can't quite, it's like when people said, oh, Shula and Alistair was the first divorce in, in Ambridge. I was like, shut up. And there it is. In, from, the, from the main characters, the first people to get divorced. All right, all right, wait, wait. This is the first divorce since the 60s. Okay. 
there had not been a kind of live character on air divorce prior to Shula and Alistair's. What? Alright, forget all that. <laughs> the point is, there hadn't been a lot of divorcing amongst the baby boomers, which is odd, right? Because that cohort had divorced. Yeah. Appearing to have, but they appeared to really. In the 60s, 50 years ago. <laughs> All right, this has taken us down a rabbit hole, but it is fair to say that married couples of either gender or you know, securely um, attached couples who have formalised their relationship in some way, producing offspring has only happened with Adam and Ian and James and Leone. And they were in it last night because so was the... Uh, my own theory is all this Bea Ambridge bullshit is about trying to up the ante in the, in the granny war between Lillian and Linda. And they've created, you know, an issue where there really wasn't one because we are preparing for the return of Mungo. <laughs> Oh, Mungo, you will inherit the earth. <laughs> so this is the old blended family Grundy network, Grundy Carter network. And the, the network shows us that in this horrific run for the Grundys, the death of Nick, this divorce of Ed and Emma, or, well... Who thinks Ed and Emma are going to get back together? <gasps> no! I, very interesting. Who really, really thinks you should leave those Grundy boys alone? <laughs> no, no, okay. Sorry? Not anymore. <laughs> so, interesting. At the time of talking, the break between Ed and Emma appears to be they have split up, right? They are not together. Emma needs to basically date somebody who isn't called Grundy and see how that works out for her. <laughs> because she has gone through this poor family like a plague. <laughs> but, so from the death of Nick, really, the poor old Grundys, who are already the Grundys and their oppressors, constantly precarious, constantly struggling, have lost Nick Grundy, quite wantonly, I thought, except the straw line was good, but, you know. And then had Will completely lose it in terms of his grief. And then Ed and Emma, so three, four years ago, the, the Grundy boys were just married fathers running independent households. And now they've boomeranged back to Clary. And the only reason that that has, is remotely sustainable is the Amber Fairy Fair. Because, I mean, you know, the point at which they are lords of their own manor again, is purely on the say so of Oliver Sterling. Not, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm still waiting for my, my sort of, you know, large farm to be gifted me by somebody. <laughs> I won't detain myself to learn this because I've realised I've talked for the whole time. But, so as Cara pointed out, the matriarch thing came up a lot, partly because at Hay, who came to Hay? Who was at Hay? You were at Hay. You could behave. I just somehow just kind of lost my equanimity and went on a rant about the matriarchs, which I didn't really know I had in me until it happened. And then I repeated it on Woman's Hour and Feedback. So, yeah. <laughs> but I did some reading, and there is a phenomenon called kin keeping from gerontology, critical gerontology. And it's back to what Cara was saying about the, the way, what they do and the way they do it. And kin keeping, in its kind of most uh, benign form is keeping in touch with family members and or keeping family members in touch with one another. So you can see this has got a network sort of thing already. Occasionally, kin keeping has been more broadly defined to include providing tangible assistance for family members. So the example we've already discussed, Peggy has given Kate somewhere to live, but that doesn't come entirely string free. That could be an example of king keeping on Peggy's part, I think. So this is a new literature for me, I thought it was quite interesting. But 
for, as, has, as I discussed previously with the forms of the different forms of capital that you deploy to have power and leverage, um, kin keeping, I think, can be used as the clearest way of class differentiation, social mobility either being accelerated or stalled, stalled I would argue. And the big question around kin keeping is how far does kin keeping intersect with making forms of capital, by which in this case I mean assets, money, wonga, cash. <laughs> does it, how does it affect its perishability, right? So back to the Aldridges. To get the Aldridges into financial trouble, they needed to give the Environment Agency hundreds of thousands of pounds because they were, you know, they're in mortgage luxury. They're kind, you know, the sort of, they're, they're so far from the gutter, it's kind of, you know, they really had to work to, to get them into any kind of peril financially. Whereas, because they've been the recipients of capital that did not perish, so it came down to them, they inherited quite literally. Same as the reason that Peggy is able to do her kin keeping with the inheritance is because the capital that she inherited from largely the, the, the cunning and trading of has proved perish has proved that you know it's sustained through her children to her grandchildren. But with what this ends up doing, it creates sticky ends in the deepening U curve of Ambridge inequality. I will go on to explain what that is. Because I can't have that time for any of this lot. Don't worry, it'll be in the book. <laughs> As you were. <laughs> this, I think, is quite interesting. So if we take those different ways to be powerful in Ambridge, kin and the ways that you can be powerful through kinship, employment relations, formal governance, informal governance, information sharing, joy, problem solving, or intimate networks on the strength of weak ties, something that's quite int intriguing and why I think Philip Moss is going to die, he has... <laughs> He hasn't really colonised any of those sorts of power bases in Ambridge. But, maybe a bit, but also, Natasha R. has, she seemed totally disinterested actually in embedding herself apart from as a party planner. So the new, these new characters have failed to demonstrate the kind of forms of power in the, in the, in the, in the city, in the village. Um, So, in order, this is, a, this is a photograph of whom? <laughs> Brad, Brad Holbin. Joe. Uh, Roy. Jim. Yeah, Jim. Oliver, yeah. It's immediately obvious to us with the basis of Ambrose. But actually what that is, is about the seven categories in the Great British Class Survey. So Mike Savage and colleagues at the LSC have unbundled the notion of ruling, working and middle class into seven categories. It was a very big deal online and everyone did their thing about how much cultural, social and wealth capital they had. Now, I haven't completely mistimed this, I'm going to have to literally just say this quickly, but the reason that it was hard to make the Aldridges lose money is because they are elite both in terms of they have strong capital both economic cultural and social right so they are an elite here and that is six percent of the uk that are in that position so that's basically the kind of the ruling class and the precariat however who are lacking both capital as in money social connections and cultural connections can be defined as the precariat. And the, um, the new thing about this version of, the, of looking at class in this way is how far that 15% who, who suffer precarity of all kinds find it impossible to improve their financial position. And this, you know, a little bit of politics, might not be very healthy. So meanwhile, 
The five new categories is all about um, differentiating between different bits of the middle class. So, you know, Susan Carter has been trying to be from here to here, from, you know, anyway. But it serves to point out that the fall of the House of Aldridge is far harder to demonstrate than the Grundys and their oppressors, according to this new schema of class, cultural, social and financial capital. So, that was it. <laughs> Okay, we've got time for just a few questions. First question. Well, is this just an observation? I don't know if um, The Grundys are... The Garan Grundys are currently richer than the Aldridges because they own a house. The Aldridges are renting half of a house that used to belong to the Tickers. Uh -huh. Are they, though? Because if you look at the whole tribe of Peggy, there is, there is housing capital in the network. And if they are, it's only temporary. And it's only will. One other question? I think uh, your net, 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 networking scheme doesn't work because you've not considered how uh, Leonard is the father of Tom Rigglesworth <laughs> and his connections into Halifax. You bugger. Also, there's a person who recently rewatched This Life, and yes, then there's yes. also doing the wild thing with. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, my. There may be some offspring from that to come from This Life. We don't know. Do who, we? Who's coming? Um, Michael. Why do you think that Natasha isn't embedded because she's married into the uh, Bodge Fiddle Law? She's doing all sorts with all the people there, um, and she's making a bit of a hit by advising lots of people about their finances. Yeah, it was a slightly off-the-cuff thing. I just was trying to place her in terms of the multi-layered different kinds of capital, and it just struck me that, rather than, so Nick going to the you know, heart of Sunday school and being kind of established, Natasha, by virtue of all her interests being outside the village, you know, business and otherwise, um, there is a kind of pull away so, I, yeah, it's not like the main thing, but yeah, I don't think she's managed to really establish a power base, and I didn't think Philip had either, but I'm prepared to be, uh, you know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. That was, has Ed slid down his power tree quickly? Yeah, yeah you're right. So, so the, in some, the other thing, in the sort of reworking the paper from Lincoln was that when you put together contractual relationships, i.e. worked or lived in a house or a job which connected you to somebody else, so legally defined contract law, once you've overlaid it from kinship, Ed was the king of Ambridge. However, all this stuff about perishable capital is a kind of mea culpa because I got it wrong because he had those contracts, but they were very perishable in the face of a misdemeanor. And what was so clever, right, is that the reason the fall of the House of Aldridge is only partial, but it's a similar scale of thing. Whatever Brian did in the 70s is quite similar to what Ed was doing now, but one resulted in his complete falling from grace as a kind of useful, brokered, you know, and the other one, as I say, we yet to see that finish finally play out. So, yes, Ed is no longer King of Ambridge by virtue of the fact that the strength of his weak ties, because of his underlying precarity, served to destroy those connections in one mistake rather than. You see what I mean? So that's kind of. That was kind of. That was kind of that okay, we've got 10 minutes or so at the end of this session anyway for more questions. So let's save those for then. 
and move on to our next speaker. Back again, very excited. Tim, do you want to come up to the stage? Good morning, everyone. How do I sound in the back? Can you hear? I sound American. I sound American, yes. <laughs> and that, that would make a lot of sense. Uh, it's, it is terrific to be back. I gave a talk at the British Library two years ago and uh, delighted to be part of this gathering. Uh, it may sound presumptuous, but I feel like this is my tribe. And, <laughs> We're really scattered in the United States. We're there, and you hear us on the caller inners on Dumpty Dum. But uh, it's really great to be here. So thank you. And thank you to Nick and Cara for setting this up in this amazing, amazing venue. Um, so by way of introduction, I teach uh, British politics and media at Western New England University in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I direct our London summer program, so I have the privilege of being here each summer teaching as well. I first heard about the Archers about six years ago when I took my students on a tour of Broadcasting House in London. It was back in the days when the BBC offered public tours. Part of the tour was a discussion of the long history of radio drama and, shall we say, docudrama in the case of the Archers. Uh, I'm not going <laughs> to fall into that trap. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it piqued my interest. It, this is a genre that has long disappeared from the airwaves in America. So I began to listen as a way of learning more about English culture. And so I have this very stylized view. And all day I'm going to be asking you things like, is Stir Up Sunday real? Is it, <laughs> is it true? Um, so, and the puddings really sit in the dark for that long, but uh, uh, let, let us hope. So, uh, it has brought me to this community. Uh, I've immersed myself to catch up as much as I can, a daunting task. I spent three days this week working on another Archer's research project here in Reading at the BBC Written Archives, where you can find the scripts going back to 1951 up through 2006. And it's really a remarkable experience to see people come and go. When they introduce new individuals into the village, I would think, well, it's getting very crowded here. But over the years, we've seen that happen. And there is that churn, as Nick pointed out so well in her presentation. Um, and this has led to my developing a course that I'll be teaching this summer, The Culture of English Villages in Fact and Fiction. And if anyone has suggestions for villages uh, within an hour or two's train ride of London where I can, we can catch a good summer fete or a village cricket match, uh, seek me out. I'd really like to know. Thank you. Um, but today what I'd like to talk about our parents, siblings, and the pursuit of power, predicting the future leaders of Ambridge. Before I start my presentation, let me offer a technical caution. Uh, to break up the slides in my talk, I've used some stock photos from the Radio 4 Archers website. Uh, and Cara flagged this when she looked at the slides, and thank you for this. Um, we all have our own images of what the villagers look like. And so these photos, please think of them as just space fillers to break up the words. Um, think of them as the stock images that we get when we buy new picture frames. And uh, just, just bear with me on that. I just needed something to break up the words. So these are my research questions. What roles do parents and siblings play in preparing someone to lead in the future? And how might parental involvement, mentoring, if you will, and birth order of children help to determine the future leaders of Ambridge? Uh, for family is where we first learn about power, as uh, political scientist Valerie Hudson tells us. 
As psychologists tell us the family is a microcosm of society, the children will learn lessons about dominance, conformity, rebellion, punishment, persuasion, strategy, frustration, and control. Am I right, or could there be a better description of growing up at Brookfield? <laughs> Bridge farm, home farm, Lower Locksley, oh, definitely all of the above. Now, as we think about uh, political socialization and how parents shape future leaders, Children internalize adult standards of behavior in terms of participation, in terms of involvement in the community. Um, we also see that parents are able to pass on uh, these traditions in different ways in their roles in the family. Scholarship tells us fathers who are active in politics tend to raise sons who have an interest in politics. Mothers, in, particularly in patriarchal societies, will influence both sons and daughters because of mother's central position in the family structure. And we see evidence of this in the archers. Neil Carter serves on the parish council. Emma has followed in his footsteps. David Archer and Jill Archer stress the value of voting and participating in community life. And they've also served on the parish council. And Pip. Uh, follows up. She's, uh, in some episodes, she's discussed politics. When she became eligible to vote, she cast her first ballot. Now, this influence can extend beyond the political arena to the business community. David and Ruth Archer, Brian Aldridge, Elizabeth Pargeter all run businesses and serve as role models, for better or for worse, uh, to the next generation of business leaders. Research shows that as children enter, enter adulthood, they'll look to their parents for career advice, daughters more so than sons. Now, brace yourself for the first stock images here. <laughs> now, um, contrast the career-seeking behavior of Pip and Josh Archer. Pip, when she contemplated after finishing university, going abroad to work in corporate agriculture, relied on David for a fair amount of advice in her decision making. Josh just went off and running with his vehicle refurbishment for better or for worse. Um, think about Alice Carter. Who does she turn to when yet another presentation? And have you ever met anyone who gives more presentations <laughs> than, than Alice Carter after Price Bauman? She turns to Brian for feedback. Please note the photo in the lower right corner is a robotic strawberry picker. Hard at work in a poly tunnel. Alice has cracked the code and she's got it to work. If you were at Merle last night, that robotic weed puller, I've been texting my wife, that is so on our shopping list. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we can look not just at scholarly research on political socialization, but also on uh, the rich literature on siblings and birth order when it comes to political achievements. There has been a great deal of study of the role of birth order and the advantage of being a firstborn child in holding office in the countries that I list here, the UK, the Netherlands, Australia, and the United States. Um, this effect is particularly strong for women in elected positions. What gives firstborn children uh, the edge as they are uh, uh, making their way in adulthood? There are two theories out there. One is parental resources theory. First children, uh, firstborn children receive a larger share of parental resources, material, attention, intellectual resources. This may involve more focused parenting. And any of you who have more than one child, you recall the second one could go missing. <laughs> For better or for worse, they would turn up, and, and they'd be okay. Uh, and this uh, has, uh, could be linked to more rapid verbal development for the firstborn, uh, more uh, uh, time spent uh, by parents instilling ambition in the firstborn. The other theory, sibling interaction theory, is that the firstborn are better equipped for power struggles 
having experience as followers with their parents, but then as leaders with their siblings, with that early memory perhaps of being displaced by the second born and having to claw back that power. What does the extant research suggest that the parental resources theory is probably the better fit in explaining the dominance of firstborn children? So what defines a firstborn child? This isn't as straightforward as it may seem. The scholarship indicates it's not just being firstborn, but also possibly uh, uh, an only child known in the literature as a singleton, or if there is a gap of five years or more between you and the nearest sibling, you might qualify as a firstborn child. Um, what are the characteristics of firstborn children? More assertive, more dominant and aggressive, maybe less empathic, more narcissistic. Pip Archer, we're looking at you. Um, <laughs> identify more with power and authority, high parental expectations, etc. So with these characteristics in mind, let's take a look at birth order in Ambridge. And uh, Nick and I did not coordinate on this, but I think uh, Rosie is one to keep an eye on. Um, but we've got Pip as the first form at Brookfield. So the Aldridges are a lot more complicated. They're really two or three families when you think about it. When you think about Jennifer birthing children over a period of 21 years. Um, so we've got Adam, uh, then we've got Xander, and I'll come back to Xander in a minute. He, he'll pose a very interesting test of the firstborn theory. Um, and then uh, uh, one might argue because of the gap between Kate and Alice, Alice might qualify as a firstborn, and then because of the unique circumstances of Rory's birth and childhood, one might argue that Rory might be considered as a firstborn or a singleton as well. At Bridge Farm, Here's where I would need to turn to the veterans because I'm not quite sure where John Archer fit into the family dynamic. Did he exhibit the tendencies of a firstborn before his untimely demise? And then Helen's family, Henry's firstborn. Well, we're co I'll come back to Henry. There's a lot. Uh, so, but, uh, uh, Lower Loxley, Lily is just by minutes the firstborn, but she does exhibit a fair number of the characteristics of firstborn there. And then in Ambridge view, view Emma, uh, firstborn of the two, and then George, firstborn of their children as well. Um, Emma has already shown her leadership ability on parish council. Could this pass on to George? Well, time will tell. He's only been a voice uh, participant in the program for a brief period of time. So I put this all together to try and predict who the future leaders of Ambridge might be. Firstborn, or in the broadest sense of the term, a parent as a strong mentor, parent as civic leader, prospects for leadership. Hip hits in all three categories, as do Alice and Rory, poten high potential for leadership. Lily uh, and Phoebe. Phoebe, I'm thinking, boy, is a, has been a mentor for her. I do wonder if Haley also filled that role uh, before Roy and Haley's relationship broke down. And then George, possibly. Let's see. The, the, the Grundy angle, though, it, it complicates everything, as, as we know. Um, and then we've got a few more to think about. We don't have enough information yet. Yes, Henry and Archer, despite being firstborn, has a complicated history. And even prior to witnessing his mother stabbing his stepfather at the, uh, when Henry was five, when he was three and a half, he saw his grandfather trampled by a bull. Uh, Twenty years from now, there is a doctoral dissertation to be written on the psychological makeup of Henry Ian Archer. Won't be me, but somebody at Academic Archers 2040, there should take it. Um, Xander Macy Craig, as this, uh, he has the advantages as a firstborn, but he may face higher expectations as the son of same-sex parents. This is more anecdotal than scholarly, but the same-sex couples I know who are raising children really feel like they have less margin for error 
because of internalized homophobia in some quarters of society. So it will be interesting to see if Xander has, high ex uh, has to face high expectations. And then, and how could we do this without talking about Molly Hartman? <laughs> According to Wikipedia, she's older than Tilly, so she is the first one. Uh, Stalwart of cricket, of theatrical productions, harasser of Rob Titchener. Sounds promising to me, but we need more information. So that concludes my presentation. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. We've got time for just two questions. Michelle has a mic. Has anybody got a question for Tim? Oh, one at the back? Okay, got one here and then one lady at the back. Um, do the script writers have access to your information so that they follow those rules? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's real life. I mean, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm convinced of it. I might not be an anarchist, but... As you watch these events unfold over the years, you think this makes a lot of sense. To a point, it breaks down with Shula. Uh, she is the eldest. Uh, she was born first, Kenton second. Kenton makes total sense. Um, but Shula and leadership, it's, it, it's not always a perfect fit, this first born theory. You say first born, you haven't brought gender into it. Are male first borns more successful than female first borns? Uh, that's a, a good question, and that is a part of the literature as well. That even if you are not firstborn, if you are the firstborn male in the family, does that give you some advantage? The, uh, the empirical findings are split on that. In terms of firstborn male, literally, it can. But more recently, the argument is because women face more hurdles in public life, they get more of a boost from being firstborn than the firstborn men do. Great, thank you, Tim. I'm the firstborn and have or had two male parents. I'm a kind of Sander Macy. <laughs> <laughs> That's really quite scary. We're going to move on to our next paper now, which is a brilliant title. Amy Sanders. says about the UK politics in 2019. And as you might have spotted, I borrowed from Linda Snell in order to create my title. And uh, she said, from the moment these two joined the people, <laughs> it's been grunge band, sumo wrestlers, and suplo competition. <laughs> so the aim of my talk is to take the discourses that we hear in Ambridge and try and understand what that tells us about Boris Johnson's Britain. <laughs> but let me give you a little background about myself first. So, just so you're aware, I've actually been visiting Ambridge since 1975, though I confess I probably took an active interest from the age of 10, um, so in 1985 onwards. And that's thanks to the wonderful woman that you see in this picture here, who is my mum. Another thing that you should be aware of is that I'm currently doing a PhD in Cardiff University, and uh, I'm actually in the final stages of the write-up of my thesis. So what better way to procrastinate than <laughs> <laughs> So, so I um, wanted to share with you what the subject of my PhD is, and I'm actually looking at researching the relationship between the third sector and government institutions. And I thought I'd use my knowledge on the third sector to share with you. Now, I'm thinking, um, I can almost hear the words of my mother when she said, when you start talking about third sector and civil society, you do need to explain what you mean. So I, I've got these definitions here for you. The first one there, third sector, pretty much refers to maybe the voluntary sector, you know, community organisations, charities, those kind of things. 
Civil society is a slightly broader definition, and it's kind of referring to any kind of association or network in which there's memberships or some kind of voluntary action. So um, those of you who aren't currently knitting but do like to be active during the talk, feel free to accept my little Twitter challenge, which is to list as many civil society examples in Ambridge as you can over the next 15 minutes. Now, um, I wanted to explain to you the kind of connection between political discourses and civil society, but forgive me, this is a very crude overgeneralisation. It's a whistle-stop tour. Um, for example, with Thatcher, we had the introduction of the market and privatisation, the shift towards individualism, and at the same time, in civil society, what we saw was charities really pushing to try and become more business-like, um, a, a real emphasis on professionalisation and, uh, and the way that they ran things using a new public management process. Then, of course, came Tony Blair with his third way. And um, when he was talking about the third way, he was specifically referring to how the third sector could be contracted to provide public services. But he was also talking about involving the third sector in um, decision making in government. Then, of course, the 2008 banking crisis came along. And David Cameron um, also started talking about the big society. Now, analysis shows that the big society is very similar language to Tony Blair's third way, but there was a fundamental difference because, of course, he was trying to introduce austerity in response to the banking crisis, and therefore, a lot of what he was talking about was volunteers subsidising services. He also um, was really focusing in on localism because... Um, uh, he was looking for people within the local community to kind of step up and subsidise those public services. So you can see there's a difference between David Cameron's localism and Margaret Thatcher's individualism. So that gives you a little sense of the relationship between the two. I'm going to skip to that slide there and share with you the method of my study. So what I'm, uh, I've been doing is a discourse analysis, because I'm interested in the conversations that we have in Ambridge and how those relate to social life. Now, I'm not the first to do something like this, because the fantastic Dr. Kimberly Wiley, she looked at what people were saying in the Big Bang Theory and in Parks and Recreation and other American TV programmes to understand what was being said about voluntary action. There's a fundamental difference with Kimberly, of course, because she was looking at the Big Bang Theory and Parks and Recreation, which we all know aren't real. <laughs> So I couldn't possibly be doing the same thing as her. Instead, I would describe my approach as an ethnographic observation, where I happen to listen in to conversations between Ambridge families, and I recorded them. Ethically dubious, I didn't get direct consent, but I think we can assume there was an element of assumed consent from those individuals. Um, now, the time sampling is really significant because I wanted to capture the time that Boris Johnson actually became Prime Minister. So I took the two-week period that sandwiched the point when he became Prime Minister back in July in 2019. And um, what I did was I looked at all the conversations, but looked for the conversations that had a reference to civil society. And then I um, transcribed all of those, coded them, and analysed it. OK, so where does that leave us? I am not the first person to look at civil society in Ambridge, and anyone who's anyone has already got a copy of this book, or might be seeking to get hold of one soon. So Nicola has already done a study looking at civil society in Ambridge, but she was focusing in on women. And what she was doing was talking about how civil society can be about developing social stability or social change, and I wanted to build on that. Brilliantly, Evers and Von Essen produced this brilliant tool to analyse this difference between change and stability. And so he came up, or they came up with the, um, the relationship between two different dimensions. First of all, the kind of civil societies that are kind of conventional, and then on the other side of that would be the civil societies that are acting for change. They came up with the other dimension, which is the difference between the public, um, the social sphere, where you're providing services, versus the political sphere where you're actually implementing decision-making. Now, all of this is deeply theoretical, so I thought I'd help everyone out here by applying it to Ambridge. And I'm going to use the example of homelessness to see if this helps. So, um, Pat, 
very helpfully, gives us our first example of the thing that fits into this first quarter here. Because, of course, she did volunteering in the Elms, which is a homelessness shelter. So that sits very neatly here because it's a very conventional form of civil society action, um, and she was providing a service to homeless people. In addition to that, then Pat went rogue and took Olwyn home which I think could be arguably a very innovative way to, um, to try and tackle homelessness. We could call it a peer-to-peer -peer buddying. I'm not sure how effective it was, but it definitely sits in that quarter over there. So well done, Pat. But both of these are providing services for homeless people. What about up there at the decision-making stage? Well, brilliantly, Emma steps up, because Emma joined the parish council and immediately started to campaign for affordable housing. So here we can see um, a very conventional form of civil society happening um, because it's the parish council, but it's very much at decision-making level. That top corner there is where the activism really happens to try and influence politics and civil society. And fabulously, Jill provides us with our perfect example of that. <laughs> when she threw that flapjack it was a clear act of civil disobedience in a public meeting. So that helps you understand the tool, but I wanted to highlight what was happening in civil society during that, those crucial two weeks. And, um, and I, I wanted to map out all of those civil society examples against this tool. Now, like Timothy, I actually do need to confess that I wanted to give you some images to represent the individuals, but yes, they are the stock images that I stole from BBC. They don't match the ones in our mind's eye of what these people look like. So prepare yourselves for this. So during these two weeks, it was actually the time that Kirsty managed to land a new job in the Wildlife Trust. It was also the time that there was a real hoo-ha between the volunteers in the community shop. And it was also the time that Shula talked to Alistair into calling an advice line to an unnamed charity for advice about his father. Now, I would argue that all three of those fit in very neatly into this bottom corner here because they're all forms of um, uh, charities, all volunteers, providing a very conventional form of service to society in general. However, they were all dwarfed by the main conversation that happened during this vital two-week period. And that was thanks to the wonderful Peggy Wood. <laughs> the Ambridge Conservation Trust was being spoken about in almost every conversation. And well done her, because it was seen as a real act of innovation. So it's very much towards the act for change se section there. Yes, she's providing a, a public service for Ambridge, but yes, it sits there. Now what about in terms of imp impacting on decision making? I'm going to give you a little insight there. We have a um, average fate planning committee. Now, the average fate is definitely a conventional form of civil society, but the fact that it's a planning committee makes it into a decision-making quarter, so it's up there in that top corner. What was distinctly absent during this two-week period was any form of activism that was happening, any form of campaigning coming from people. There was no flapjack throwing. <laughs> There was no destruction of GM crops. So I don't know, maybe it was only a two-week period. So maybe it will be, that kind of civic action will be coming back into Ambridge. But it is something to look out for. Is it a cause of concern? Now, I got really excited, plotting civil society against these different dimensions. And I started to wonder if there were other dimensions I should be considering. One particular dimension comes from Aiken and Taylor, and they said, what about the distinction between philanthropy and mutualism? Where philanthropy is all about giving to others. It's giving arms to the poor, if you will. It's a real form of altruism. But in contrast, mutualism is very much more about a common pot of resources, where a community might do things for themselves. So I thought, well, yes, we could plot that on a dimension between philanthropy and mutualism. So where does civil society in Ambridge fit in here? It was very easy to plot. For example, the Fate Planning Committee and the volunteers in the community shop, they sit very neatly at this end, in the mutualism end of the scale, because it's very much the community doing things for themselves. Now, Kirsty's volunteers in the Wildlife Trust, 
Well, no, that's a very clear act of philanthropy. And also, um, Peggy's Ambridge Conservation Trust is a very clear act of philanthropy. As Peggy tells Lillian quite sternly, I have thought about it, and I'm certain it's the right thing to do. I want to invest in our future. This money could make a real difference for all of Ambridge. So this sounds very much like philanthropy, doesn't it? But it's philanthropy with a difference. I'd say Peggy's philanthropy is an indication of a change that we see. Is Peggy's philanthropy a shift in the funding of civil society in Ambridge? It, I'm not the first to suggest this. Phillips and Hebbs talked about how in the UK we might be shifting more towards a North American model of civil society in which we have wealthy individuals using their fortunes to fund um, social enterprises. So what I'm really suggesting is something like this. <laughs> <laughs> is Peggy Andrew's answer to Bill Gates? <laughs> well now think about that for a moment. Inspiring something else because each of the proposals would count as a different form of civil society action and they don't really fit very neatly into my little philanthropy mutualism scale. Let me share with you some of the things people said. Eddie <laughs> said, How are we going to get our hands on Peggy's 500 grand? Which I think is a very clear example of self interest and individualism. Um, then, of course, there was both Tom and Natasha, who very much wanted to kick Eddie out of their little gang. And she said, because it's a family project for Tom and I. So I think we can see a very distinct form of family individualism happening there. Now, Phoebe sounded like she had a philanthropic means. She was talking about, this is a brilliant chance for someone to make a real difference. But the someone is very important. Because, of course, she is related to Brian, and she was thinking about her ambitions. As she tells Kirsty earlier on, I just feel so flat from being back here from Oxford. So even for Phoebe, she was really self-motivated by her own aspirations. Now, this all puts me in mind of another dimension that I wanted to share with you, and that's the distinction between professionalisation and volunteering. Because, of course, with professionalisation, um, the civil society might be trying to get more professional, but with volunteering, we might see volunteers replacing professionals. So I decided to map our civil society examples against the, that dimension. And this is what I came up with. But I've only got time to share a couple of those with you. So the, um, I'm going to concentrate on the Ambridge Conservation Trust to start out with. And as Lillian, for, oh sorry, Peggy Forsery told Lillian, I had to make sure the trust was set up properly. With all this money at stake, it needs to be watertight. Now, we need to remember that we are being constantly reminded Peggy is not to be underestimated. She is an experienced businesswoman, and she brings that professionalism to the Ambridge Conservation Trust. And not only that, but she's inspiring it in all the people that are submitting proposals to her trust. For as Tom says to Natasha, um, it's down to the bottom line. In fact, none of us here would ever want to hear Eddie Grundy being bad man. But Tom didn't hesitate. He said, honestly, if Fran sees Eddie Grundy's name on our proposal, she won't touch it with a barge pole. <laughs> now, um, this is the kind of hard-nosed business sense that we don't traditionally associate with civil society. So maybe I had Peggy Woolley wrong. Maybe, she, in fact, it is this. Is she? <laughs> Ambridge's answer to Alan Sugar. <laughs> now, the volunteering in the community shop is a very different example. Is it successful? Let me share this with you. Um, I wanted to remind you of the time that Jazza was really supportive when Jim was struggling to sleep at night. Um, and, and Jim needed to be in the shop the next day, and Jazza encouraged him not to. But then Jill took over from him the next day, but was very ungracious about it, and actually was very resentful of Jim and criticised him quite heavily for not turning up to volunteer in the shop. Now, I would say that here, the cracks are starting to show 
in which the over-reliance on volunteers to deliver services in place of the paid staff is starting to place a strain. Um, I'm not the first to say that. That was a criticism that was levelled at big society too. But there was another point that I was discussing with my friends and family last night, which is also, I always used to like Jill. When did she become <laughs> our <Amber's> good <laughs> answer to Katie Hopkins? <laughs> so, um, my timing is a little bit tight, but I do want to share one more thought with you which was when we look at the conversation between Linda, Ben and Rory. And Linda was really concerned about the younger people's contribution to the decision making. Linda said, all I'm trying to do is protect the faith from the vagaries of the modern world. Now, Linda needs to be aware, because actually she's in danger of having the OK Boomer um, meme directed at her. For those of you who aren't clear, it's significantly in political discourse at the moment of the tension between the generations. Happily, wonderful Robert was there to smooth things over with Linda, and, and he inspired her, saying, if you want something to have a future, you have to let it go. And I never thought of generations working well together. I wanted to finish with this fantastic picture of me and my mum. <laughs> this is us travelling to Academic Archers last year. Um, and you might recognise this face. Look out for her. She might be in this conference today. <laughs> so um, I'm going to finish there and so say thank you for listening and leave you with a little summary. I like to do a load extra minutes because she mentioned me. So we are running a bit tight for time. Are there any questions for clarification from Amy? Or I would say maybe. Can you catch her over a sandwich? Is that all right? Yeah. What's happening now? Coffee? Keep going. <laughs>